This is a brief overview of some of the CUDA hardware that's been around for years now. Wanted to give you some kind of perspective on where we've been, where the current generation is, and kind of where we're headed maybe. Uh, by way of overview, I want to spend a little bit of time just refreshing your thinking about the differences between a CPU and a GPU. And on the left here, we've got an illustration of a typical modern CPU. Uh, this particular one is showing a four-core architecture. So there's individual processing cores that are part of the same chip. And they have the core itself, which is the kind of the processing logic that's actually doing things. You could think of this um, in general terms as sort of the arithmetic logic unit, the ALU. And then there's going to be, for each of the cores, um, this would be typical of, for example, a current Intel processor, uh, there's going to be some level one cache that's dedicated to that core. It's often split into instruction cache and data cache. There's also going to be a bunch of control logic, so circuitry that kind of orchestrates the behavior of the core, uh, which is distinct from the core itself in the sense that the core is there to do the computation, to do an addition or a multiplication or whatever, and the control logic is there to orchestrate that process. Uh, so there's basically four copies of that stamped out on this particular chip, and then a very large proportion of the chip is going to be taken up by additional cache memory to improve the performance of the processor to lower the latency, um, which is kind of the focus of a CPU uh, processor. Uh, so we'll have some level 2 cache that's going to be shared in different ways in different architectures, and then in level 3 cache that's usually uh, shared across all of the cores. And that's kind of where the processor chip ends. And of course, we can't have a, a modern computer without additional memory, so the DRAM here is just the general memory on the motherboard, for example. Um, again, the point of the architecture of the CPU is to run a lot of different types of compute jobs very flexibly and with very low latency. Uh, hence all of the cache that's devoted, or the space that's devoted on the chip to cache. When we look at the, look at the GPU then, obviously the, the architecture is quite a lot different. So uh, there's going to be still control logic and a little bit of cache memory that's going on across the GPU. But the overwhelming majority of the GPU chip itself is going to be given over to processing cores, and very many of them. The key difference here is that the emphasis on the GPU side is not going to be low latency, in other words, something that's going to require a lot of elaborate caching uh, in, the, in the memory hierarchy, but high throughput. So we can uh, apply a lot of different processing cores to do small pieces of calculations of the overall job that we're trying to accomplish. And by reducing the amount of chip space that's dedicated to these kinds of other things like caching and, and more elaborate control, you know, out-of-order execution and that kind of stuff, we can dramatically improve the number of cores or increase the number of cores that are available on the chip. So we can just do more processing. Now, it's not going to be as low latency because we don't have all of that caching. We've got a little bit of cache, but not much by comparison to a CPU. But because we have so many individual processing cores, we can do a lot of calculation per time. In other words, the throughput can be very high, even though the latency isn't super great. Uh, GPU is also going to have some amount of level 2 cache that's shared across all of the cores. And then, uh, as with the CPU, we've got some external memory uh, called DRAM here. This would be, say, in a typical desktop kind of installation, you'd have a graphics processing unit that plugged into the back plane of the motherboard, and it would include its own memory, uh, sometimes called graphics memory or frame buffer memory or whatever. For our purposes in general purpose GPU computing, we're not really thinking of that necessarily as something that's going to be used to drive a video display, although in a graphics card that's almost always what it's being used for. Uh, but we do have local memory on the video card that's accessible to the to the GPU. Here's a not so brief summary of the various generations that uh, NVIDIA has been through with its CUDA architecture, uh, sort of uh, a history of graphics processing. If we, if we go back here to the very beginning, in 1999 saw the introduction of NVIDIA's GeForce 256 which was really the first graphics processing unit to, to be released into the wild. Uh, and there was a whole variety of different improvements on that card uh, throughout the, uh, the early 2000s. 
Um, where we're really interested here is at the beginning of what I've what I've labeled here the beginning of kind of the CUDA era. Starting here in 2008 and kind of going forward until the present, we've got sort of the modern era of GPUs. And a key distinguishing characteristic here is that these GPUs allow for very high performance graphics generation, but they also are being designed to allow for general purpose computing, which is really our interest in them in this course. Uh, so the first uh, of these, uh, what, what NVIDIA refers to as the microarchitecture, uh, which is just kind of a, a generation or a family of GPU processors that they've released that have kind of common characteristics. Uh, the first of those was called Tesla. Uh, it was introduced in 2008. And uh, there's just some interesting statistics here you can see across these different generations. Um, the first of these is the, the process. And the process, by, by that I mean, the, the fabrication process that was used to make the chips. Uh, and one way of uh, understanding the, the differences from one process to another is what's known as the feature size, or the basically the size of a single transistor or a single component that you're gonna put down on the, on the chip itself. And that's uh, measured in nanometers, which is pretty small. And you can see back in the, in the late 90s with the first GPU, they were working at 220 nanometers. Uh, and by the time we got to 2008 with the Tesla, we were down to 65 nanometers, and that's been decreasing ever since. Uh, to, to the present generation of NVIDIA GPUs uses a seven nanometer process. So it's, it's a couple of hundred times denser than what we had back at the beginning. The upside is that you can, con you can fit more components on the surface of a chip, which allows you to build something that's more and more capable. Um, you can see also a similar measure here in the next column, the number of transistors that are on that chip, which surprisingly is something that um, NVIDIA is pretty happy to trumpet. Uh, if you look for that kind of information from Intel or AMD, the sort of the CPU vendors, they're less, uh, they're less happy about sharing that information. But you can see we went from, you know, in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred million transistors, which is still a lot, uh, to now the, the Ampere microarchitecture is at 28.3 billion transistors on one chip, which is, that's just a lot of billions. Um, so we're seeing uh, smaller and smaller feature sizes, which leads to larger and larger numbers of transistors that we can use. And, um, and that means more and more capability over time. And we're gonna kind of unpack some of these microarchitecture generations. So we'll start with Tesla. Let me just um, point out some highlights here that I've put over here in the notes column. Uh, at the Pascal architecture, one of the things that uh, NVIDIA introduced was this notion of a unified memory. Um, we'll, we'll sort of be working with the less capable pr uh, parts here, so we won't have that advantage of this unified memory. We have, to we have to orchestrate moving information back and forth between CPU memory and GPU memory, but um, that's kind of cumbersome and results in some limitations and more complexity in the code. Uh, and so NVIDIA has tried to address that by, uh, first of all, making the memory space on the GPU itself unified. So we'll, we'll talk about the different types of memory that are on the GPU. And those now are uh, accessible through a single address space. But they've also now provided a mechanism where you can program uh, your applications in such a way that whether you allocate memory on the CPU memory or on the GPU memory, they're considered part of the same address space and you can kind of move things back and forth and access those memories uh, kind of transparently in your code and then the runtime environment moves things back and forth. Um, in, with the Volta uh, microarchitecture in 2017, uh, NVIDIA introduced what they call tensor cores. So uh, obviously at this point in, in history, we're seeing the, the rise of machine learning and deep neural networks and the use of GPUs specifically to train neural networks and also to evaluate uh, and solve problems using those neural networks. And although the, the prior generations of GPUs were really good at that, um, what NVIDIA tried to do was uh, introduce uh, technology specifically designed for processing deep neural networks. And that's what they refer to as their tensor cores. And then in 2019, with the Turing microarchitecture, they uh, added uh, a ray tracing capability, so essentially real-time ray tracing for graphics rendering. Uh, and a fairly considerable percentage of the chip's surface uh, in the Turing uh, architecture is dedicated specifically to ray tracing. So in a way, we're seeing kind of another one of these pendulum swings that we see in computing quite regularly. Back in the, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, 
there wasn't um, any kind of general purpose focus in the design of these chips. It was very specific logic on these chips that was focused on doing graphics stuff only. And in order to use those generations of chips for general purpose computing, you had to kind of recast your problem as a graphics problem, let the GPU do its thing, and then kind of map it back into the the, uh, the more familiar computing domain. Um, and with with starting with the Tesla architecture, that was not really necessary anymore. You could just program your application directly. But now we're starting to see a, a return a little bit to some dedicated hardware that's really focused on graphics, uh, in this case, to do to do real-time ray tracing. Um, another thing here is that there's a little bit of terminological confusion, and we'll see that there's different terminology that gets used in different generations. There's a little variation over time. But because the first microarchitecture that NVIDIA introduced that did general-purpose computing uh, was called Tesla, they have kind of held that term to refer not only to this specific generation of chips, but to refer to the basic idea of doing general purpose computing on the on the NVIDIA chipset. So you'll still hear, hear and read people talking about the Tesla cores, and that really just is a general, or has become kind of a general reference to this ability to do general purpose computing on the GPU. And one final note here from this table is uh, the next generation of chip that NVIDIA has announced is actually named after Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, who was one of the early pioneers in computing, and it was kind of cool to see. Uh, she's also the first woman on this list. Obviously, these are the names of famous scientists and engineers and so forth over time. And she's the first woman and you know, one of the f sort of founding uh, founders of computer science in, in many ways with the introduction of some of the work that she did uh, years ago. All right, um, there's lots of terminology that you kind of need to get embedded a little bit when you're reading and, and, and trying to understand these GPUs. So this is kind of a little secret decoder ring, some of the common things that might be mystifying. Uh, I've starred the ones that are really important. So th these, two, uh, these two terms here, the streaming multiprocessor and the streaming processor, unfortunately they're kind of close in, in meaning and also in terms of the initialism that's used to re represent them. But those are really the two major kind of groupings of processors or processing capability that we care about in the GPU. There's, there's still some specialized graphics focused kinds of uh, hardware units on the GPU itself. We're not really going to drill into those in any sort of detail. Um, and you got to kind of filter those things out when you're reading documentation and, and spec sheets and stuff for NVIDIA products when you're just thinking about doing CUDA programming as opposed to doing graphics programming. Um, I, I learned something new the other day that these are not acronyms, that they're actually called initialisms. Uh, an acronym is an initialism that's also a pronounceable word. So unless you want to pronounce this SM as SMUM or SMUP or something like that, they're not actually acronyms, they're initialisms. So there you go, free knowledge. Um, in addition, uh, these are some other, other terminologies that get used pretty regularly. Um, so the... Um, the streaming multiprocessor is kind of a collection of streaming processors. So a multiprocessor contains processor. Uh, and those streaming multiprocessors are also clustered together in kind of larger units on the chip. And we'll see ref references to the TPC, which stands for texture slash processor cluster, and GPC, which stands for graphics processing cluster. And these, um, I don't know that the distinction between them is that important. Uh, they're really just larger groupings of symmetric multiprocessors, which are themselves groupings of streaming process, sorry, streaming multiprocessors, which group streaming processors. And then something else here, um, the, the, there's an important difference here between this, the single precision and double precision arithmetic that are performed by the streaming processors. In the early going, uh, because the the density with which the manufacturers could get uh, features on the chips, uh, the early streaming processors tended to be single precision, which basically meant they could do 32-bit arithmetic, um, as opposed to uh, double precision, which is 64-bit. Um, so th there was a, uh, in order to do the 64-bit calculations, which you could still do, you had to sort of split them up and run half of each on two different streaming processors, which essentially halved the performance. Uh, but at some point along the way, NVIDIA figured out ways to get enough transistors on the surface of the chip to allow you to do direct double precision arithmetic. And when that uh, starts to arise in the history of these, of these chipsets, 
we'll, we'll kind of point out where, where we see uh, them starting to cite both single precision and double precision processing on a single GPU. This is a, an illustration that I thought was particularly clear in expressing the different main components of an NVIDIA GPU. This actually corresponds to the GeForce 8800, which was one of the first Tesla microarchitecture chipsets that was released. Um, and uh, I don't expect you to kind of understand all of the details here, but it kind of gives you a nice sort of overall view of things. So we can see here that uh, the, the GPU, as labeled here, uh, is really the main portion of what's going on on this chip. There's some other things happening, like there's a connection to allow you to talk to the host computer, um, to, to access the memory on the, on the motherboard, and so forth, uh, as well as access here to, to DRAM that's on the, on the board, right? So this is the, the video RAM memory or the frame buffer memory. But what we're interested in here is kind of this central portion that represents the key com computational components that are in play here on a, on a GPU. So in this particular chip, there are eight of these TPCs, which as you'll recall back here, st stands for texture slash processor cluster. And we're thinking about this as the processor cluster. Uh, so this is just a kind of a high level grouping of the streaming multiprocessor and the streaming processor uh, to provide a mechanism to kind of get multiple different parts of the chip to do different things at different times and so forth. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of technology turned under to figure out how to do that. A lot of these block diagram elements up here are are focused on doing that. And we're going to drill down into what's going on inside those TPCs. Some other thing going on, other things going on here, um, there's a what it just says interconnection network. Um, the uh, the, the genesis of this whole notion of a streaming multiprocessor or streaming processors within the streaming multiprocessors is that you can sort of stream a calculation from one processor to the next processor to the next processor within the, within the GPU. So if you, if you go back and look at some of the uh, implementation details of an early graphics processing unit, what you would find is that uh, you'd get some input from the CPU, right? So some, some element of the model that you were trying to render, say, in 3D or 2D. And then there would be a series of processors that were very specifically tailored in the hardware to handle the, the different stages in what's called the graphics processing pipeline. So the CPU feeds the GPU some sort of information about a vertex or, or, or whatever in the scene that's to be rendered. And then these different stages along the way represented very specific pieces of hardware that did certain kinds of things and would stream from one to the next to the next. And eventually, at the end of this process, the, the final, final processor in the step is going to put something into, into the DRAM, the frame buffer memory, so it actually shows up on the screen. Now that's all fine and good, except that's not very flexible. So if you know if this particular step in the process uh, is really busy, and this step in the process is really not doing very much for a particular scene that's being rendered, you're sort of leaving processing power on the table. But because these are purpose-built units within the GPU, there's really no way to flexibly uh, alter that behavior in order to get certain parts of the hardware to do a different job than it was designed for. So the idea here of, um, but, but I, I, let me step back. You can see here the notion of streaming though, right? The information's coming from the C CPU and it streams from one processing element to the next to the next until it finally ends up in the frame buffer. So that notion of streaming is still really important. But instead of having these kind of purpose-built modules that only do one kind of calculation, the idea in the general purpose GPU or the CUDA architecture is to say, let's not, let's not have these specific units. Let's, let's instead offer a very powerful, very flexible general purpose processor and allow it to be hooked up in such a way that we get this kind of streaming behavior. So what we'll see here, each of the little elements inside these um, inside these TPCs is one of those processors. And um, you'll you'll notice here that uh, uh, in this in this kind of uh, <laughs> very primitive representation of a graphics processing pipeline, this this is kind of a long series of operations. Not I mean not really long, but um, there's multiple steps in that process. And what what the, uh, what the uh, streaming multiprocessor, the streaming processor architecture in CUDA tries to do is to give you an ability to do this kind of streaming from one pr process to another to another, but using these general purpose stream processor um, elements. 
The interconnection network then is responsible for sort of routing intermediate calculation results from one streaming processor to another. But instead of it being, uh, instead of it being um, helpful to think about it as kind of a linear chain, instead what you're seeing is the ability for, say, one of these TPCs to do a bunch of calculations, and that output goes onto this interconnection network and might feed into another set of stream processors, which could do a different calculation, and then those results could stream into another one, and eventually that information is going to, or the result of those ca calculations is going to make it out to DRAM. So you can still get the uh, this ability to stream calculations from one stage to the next stage to the next stage as you transform the information from something that's used to model the scene on the CPU and end up with pixels on the screen at the end of that process. Um, but it's now more flexible than what you had when you had dedicated processing stages. Uh, so if, um, if you have more, um, more need to replicate the behavior of this block, you might allocate several of the TPCs to doing this function, and only one of them, for example, just kind of making this up, uh, to handle this next set of functionality. And because the processors in the streaming, streaming multiprocessor are general purpose computers, right, you can have them do any of these functions uh, that you'd like and, and change that over time during the execution of a single program or between different programs that are going to run on the GPU. The other cool thing about that is um, we can now use these general purpose streaming processors to do whatever kind of calculations we want, whether it's specifically tailored to doing some graphics thing or we're just doing, a, say, a large matrix uh, operation that we're storing out here in, in frame buffer memory, but we're never actually going to show on the screen what that frame buffer memory contains because it's just data at that point. It's not designed to be pixels. Uh, it's just the, uh, the input or the output from the calculation that we're doing on all of these very large number of streaming processors. Here's a little zoomed in view. So this is that uh, the picture of the overall architecture of the GPU for the 8800. And this kind of gives you a little bit more detail on this um, on this TPC, the, pro the processing cluster. So there's two units inside of here that are of interest to us, um, both of which are labeled SM for streaming multiprocessor. And within the streaming multiprocessor, there are the individual SPs, the streaming processor. And it's the SP that's really, I mean, this is what, we're, what we refer to as a core in informal terms, right? That's a, that's a GPU core or a CUDA core, you could call it. And you can see in this architecture, we have um, uh, eight of those cores, eight of those SPs grouped together into an SM, and we've got two of those SMs that are grouped together into a TPC, and then we saw previously that we have eight of these TPCs that are grouped together to make up the entirety of the GPU. I've also got here uh, in a little bit of an exploded diagram of an individual stream, streaming multiprocessor, so we can see here in a little bit more detail, we've got the streaming processors, of course, we have some special functional units, which do things like transcendental functions, like sine and cosine, and that sort of thing. Um, we've got some caching going on, as I mentioned, per, uh, per streaming multiprocessor. So there's an instruction level cache. There's also what's called a constant cache. So you, if you have specific constant values that you need to refer to uh, over and over again um, nearby the processors, but that need, that need to change over time, you can store those in that cache. Uh, and then there's also some shared memory which allows access or provides access to all of the SPs on an SM. So if you have uh, a calculation that, that you need to split up into smaller pieces and allow those individual pieces to collaborate with one another to solve the overall problem, even at the level of individual SPs within an SM, they have access to this shared memory. Programming the SPs, if they need to collaborate over shared memory, is quite similar to what we were looking at in the early part of the term when we were doing pthreads programming. In particular, all of the SPs can access directly the shared memory within the SM, and in order to get them to cooperate with one another, you need to do things like synchronizing access to memory so that you don't step on each other's toes. So buried inside of this whole architecture is a little shared memory machine uh, with some number of SPs attached to that shared memory. And then, of course, uh, because there is this large collection of DRAM memory that's attached to the entire uh, GPU, the, uh, the SPs can also access that global memory as well.
All right, so we're going to take a kind of a quick tour through these generations of the uh, the chips the chipsets and the microarchitectures that we've been talking about. So, starting out with the Tesla architecture, and we've kind of looked at this uh, from from the previous illustration. Uh, this is another representation of that same um, 8800 core. Uh, but I wanted to just kind of, for consistency here, uh, break out some of the key statistics. So this guy uh, has eight, at this point they were calling them graphics processing clusters. So each of these guys is a GPC. And then within each of those, there's two individual um, uh, uh, SMs, uh, which means we have a total of 16 streaming multiprocessors. And within each of those streaming multiprocessors, as we've seen already, there were eight streaming processors for a total of 128 streaming processors in this GPU. And then there's other things out here too. This block um, is for information about like shading and kind of graphic specific things that we're gonna just sort of ignore. And remember that there is an L1 cache uh, that's associated with the GPC, and then an L2 cache that can be shared among um, multiple uh, SMs before we get out to frame buffer memory here, the FB. And then we can zoom in again on the individual um, streaming multiprocessor. So just one of these chunks of the, the TPC is the streaming multiprocessor and it's got streaming processors inside of it. Uh, and then these other units here have more to do with, with uh, dealing with some graphic specific things like texture, uh, texture maps. Another um, release in kind of the second generation of Tesla uh, chips was the GeForce 280. This is also in 2006. I guess there was a little bit more emphasis. This is again um, an illustration grabbed from some of the documentation and white papers about these guys. So 3D uh, diagrams was apparently really cool at that point. Um, so uh, we have a little bit more capable uh, chip here. We've got 10 TPCs, each of which has three streaming multiprocessors, so a total of 30 streaming multiprocessors. And each of those, uh, again, had eight uh, streaming processors for a total of 240 streaming processors. And I'll have a little summary slide here at the end that lets us kind of compare these key statistics that I've kind of outlined here um, for the number of SMs and the number of SPs. That's really the critical, uh, the critical number that we're interested in when we're thinking about how do we program this uh, using the CUDA platform. This is a, a, a little um, larger view of an individual TPC, right? So there's 10 of these, so we're looking at one of these guys. And you can see here's the three streaming multiprocessors, each of which has eight individual, again, cores, or S, this is the streaming processor, the SP, or the core. And then there's some uh, local memory, that would be the shared memory that's available to all these cores. And then some texture stuff and a, and a shared L1 cache across this um, this TPC. Okay, 2010 uh, saw the introduction of the Fermi microarchitecture, um, and you can see here this again uh, ripped from the headlines, just straight from the documentation. Uh, here we're showing that there's 16 streaming multiprocessors, so they're not really breaking these out in uh, in detail as TPCs at this point in history. I'm not sure exactly why. And we can see, so here's basically one of those streaming multiprocessors. And each of those has 32 SPs for a total of 512 SPs. And they're just kind of laying this out differently. We still have local cache here within the, the streaming multiprocessors. There's a level two cache as well. And then the, the blocks on the outside are, are basically showing you interfaces to the dynamic memory. Uh, if we zoom in on one of these uh, SMs, we can see here that we've got, um, a bunch of cores. I mentioned uh, 30, 32 cores or 32 SPs per SM. So each of these is a core and there's actually a little exploded diagram here of the core. Notice that this guy has both a floating point unit and an integer unit. So there's two different paths through this core that allow you to simultaneously do a floating point operation and an integer operation. So you kind of get double your money if you want for, the, for certain kinds of calculations. You can have both of those things active. Um, I think at this point we're still in the single precision uh, world. So if you wanted to do double precision arithmetic, you had to, had to figure out how to how to use these things to do that. Um, we've also here called out uh, the load store unit. So this is a, a way of streamlining access to memory. And then the special function units uh, of which there's just four, because presumably you're not gonna do that many, you know, sine and cosine and transcendental operations. Uh, uh, as you are normal sort of um, arithmetic operations. 
can see here there's there's shared memory, the 664K of shared memory per SM, which results in a lot of memory in, in total, uh, a connection, the interconnection network to allow you to stream calculations from one processor to the next. And the cores also, we haven't seen this yet, um, this is essentially core local memory. So in the, if you recall in, this, in a CPU, uh, each of the processor cores has a register file, right? Sort of really fast, nearby static RAM that's really quick to access by the cores. There's a similar thing here for the CUDA cores. Uh, the register file is quite a lot larger. It's 32,000 entries of 32,000 uh, 32-bit 32 registers. Uh, and those are divided evenly across the individual cores. And since there's 32 of those on this chip, uh, each of those is going to get 1,000 or 1K 32-bit registers that it can individually access really quickly. So there's really three levels in the memory hierarchy. An individual core has its own dedicated registers from the register file. So this is split up 32 different ways. Those cores can all access the shared memory, the 64K of shared memory here, and then they can also access the, what's called the global memory, which is really just the DRAM frame buffers on the GPU card itself. Next up was Kepler in 2012, and the illustration just gets more and more dense. Um, so you can see there's you know many more components that are that are fitting on the on the chip surface here, and again this is just a result of having a higher density fabrication process that lets you put more processing power on the same chip. Uh, so this guy has 15 streaming multiprocessors, each of which has 192 processors for a total of almost 3,000 SPs on a single chip. Otherwise, the architecture is quite similar. Level 1 cache, level 2 cache, access to DRAM, a local register files, and so forth. Um, here's a, an exploded view of an almost uh, in hard, almost impossible to read a view of this of this chip, but you can see that there's a whole variety of different cores now that are going to be included in here. Some of them are starting to be able to provide uh, native improvements to floating point calculations and so forth. They've all got load store units, um, and then there's also some special function units here for transcendental operations. Uh, similarly, there's still shared memory. And each of these guys is also going to have pieces of a register file. So it's kind of more of the same being stamped out here to provide higher throughput calculations. We moved to the Maxwell architecture in 2014. Notice these are nicely evenly spaced for the most part in two-year increments. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of a Maxwell um, GPU, but I did find an illustration of a Maxwell uh, streaming multiprocessor. Uh, NVIDIA kind of played with names here, so they called some of the SMs SMs and some of them SMXs and SMMs. It's all kind of the same idea. Here we've got, uh, on, on the typical Maxwell architecture, we're going to have 16 of these SMs with 120 SPs per SM. So this is one of those SMs, and you end up with uh, 2,000 uh, streaming processors per chip. Again, very similar kinds of pieces of functionality here. I'm not going to drill down into these for each for each chipset, but uh, you, you get the idea that it's just kind of more of the same. 2016 introduced the Pascal architecture, um, and as you can see, higher density. We've got uh, now they're starting to use um, the term graphics processing cluster, or graphics processor cluster. So there's six of these, and you can see each of those is this larger group um, of, of processing elements. Within each of those, there's 10 streaming multiprocessors, right? So back at the early generations of Tesla, we had 10 streaming processors on the whole chip. Now we've got 10 of them just in this one little section of the chip, and we can stamp that out a bunch of different times. So with six GPCs and 10 SMs per, we've got 60 streaming multiprocessors, and those can each have 64 SPs, giving us a total of almost 4,000 streaming processors on one chip. Otherwise, similar things. Level 1 cache, level 2 cache, register files, memory access. Here's a close-up view of the individual uh, SMs and SPs. So you can see here there's uh, some ordinary cores, which are similar to what we've been seeing already. But there's uh, these DP units, stand for double precision units, so they know how to do double precision arithmetic. Um, as well as single precision. Uh, there's a load store unit for memory access and then a special function unit for each group of four cores. So again, more capability on the chip, uh, giving you more flexibility for the calculations you're going to do. Um, shared memory, 
Uh, there's a register file for the individual processors, and of course we have access to global memory. Volta in 2017, um, again, more of the same. We've got now still six graphics processing clusters, but instead of 10 SMs per, we've got 14 per for a total of 84 streaming multiprocessors. And now we're to the point where we're kind of pulling apart um, single precision and double precision. So each of these SMs has 64 single precision cores for floating point, 64 single precision cores for integer arithmetic, and 32 cores for double precision floating point. And that's kind of the holy grail here for GPUs in general purpose computing. Most of the modeling that gets done in, um, in physical simulations and similar sorts of things um, require double precision arithmetic uh, to be at all accurate. And so the introduction of dedicated cores on these GPUs was a big deal. And then um, if we you know, kind of multiply these things out, we see that we're getting an excess of 5,000 single precision cores and almost 3,000 double precision floating point cores on one chip. Here's a uh, illustration of the uh, of the uh, SM, an individual SM with its SPs, kind of similar to before. What's new here is these tensor cores. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the important uses of a GPU these days is in the machine learning uh, area where we're training uh, deep neural networks to understand classification problems and similar sorts of things. Um, and that's the, the, uh, the dedicated hardware that NVIDIA builds onto their chips that's focused on providing capabilities for that are referred to as tensor cores. So these are kind of purpose-built um, variations on the underlying SP processor that do uh, directly some of the basic calculations that are necessary for training and evaluating a neural net. Turing, 2018, here again, more of the same. We've got 72 SMs in total, um, 64 cores per SM, eight tensor cores per SM, so that kind of continues going forward. So we've got almost 5,000 cores, CUDA cores, and um, more than 500 tensor cores. Otherwise, L1, L2, memory access, and so forth is quite similar. Um, this is a so this is just a diagram of the of the chip. This right here is actually a micrograph. Uh, so that's actually what the what the components on the chip itself look like. And you can see that you know when we say stamp out another core, that's literally what's going on here. They're just duplicating that particular chunk of the uh, of the uh, of the image that's used to etch the components into the surface of the silicon. Um, and and it's really evident how that's uh, set up when you see a, an actual picture of it. And then here's the, the detail here of, the, of a single SM and its SPs, uh, same as before, right? We've got some integer, floating, integer units, some floating point units, some tensor cores, uh, register files, cache, special function units, and so forth. Finally, the Ampere architecture is the current one. Um, so here's an Ampere GPU. Um, it's got uh, seven uh, graphics processing clusters. Well, this looks like eight in the picture, uh, with 12 SMs per, so a total of 84 um, uh, streaming multiprocessors. And then a, a, this, a, additional statistics here, 128 cores per SM, which gives us a really, finally, you know, we're over 10,000 CUDA cores just on this one chip uh, across all of the SMs uh, within each GPC, and 336 tensor cores. Uh, you know, one of the things that you see when you look at these statistics over time is, is the manufacturer kind of goes back and forth between, you know, what are they truly really trying to emphasize here? Um, how, how much space on the chip do they dedicate to different kinds of processors? Uh, and they're really trying to respond to market demands, right? Is it going to be more important for us to just do raw graphics processing? Is it going to be more important for us to provide good capabilities for machine learning and that kind of stuff? Um, and you can see maybe a little decreased emphasis in a way on, on the tensor cores from the previous generation architecture um, and more of an emphasis on just individual, uh, individual standard CUDA cores. Uh, I should also point out that this is kind of one sample of one particular chip at, at each of the architecture levels. If you go look, look uh, around at different releases from NVIDIA, um, you'll see that, that they will have various... Uh, various variations on these statistics within the same processor family. So there might be, you know, 10 chip, I'm making this up, but 10 chips in the Ampere family 
that have different numbers of each of these types of processors that are intended to kind of focus on different markets, right? Is this a chip that's going to be used for high-performance supercomputing? Is this a chip that's going to be uh, used for, um, you know, high-capacity high desktop rendering, like uh, at a, a graphics company or a film production company or um, for a high-end engineering workstation? Or is this going to be a GP that's going to be used in a mobile device, which obviously has considerable constraints around power and that sort of thing? So these are these are not the only versions of of this of the statistics for these chips. It's just kind of a representative sample. And then here's the um, the Ampere streaming multiprocessor. And again, you can see integer units, floating point units, 64-bit floating point units, and then the tensor core as well. By way of summary, so here's kind of the the same histor historic perspective here, going back to 2008 and the different microarchitectures. And what I've done here is just collected together the f from these slides. And again, these are just representative numbers. You can find um, parts in each of these product families that have more or less uh, SMs or SPs, but just kind of a representative sample. Um, you know, back here we had 128 SPs. Now we're at uh, 10,000 SPs, which is pretty remarkable growth. I um, also wanted to point out here that the uh, the processors on our what are what we call our pseudo lab, uh, those machines actually have a Quadro K620, which is not a super recent um, uh, super recent uh, GPU board in them. Um, you can tell here by the model number with the K in it that this actually follows the Kepler architecture. And the Kepler that we looked at earlier has 15 SMs and a lot of SPs. The ones in the pseudo lab actually are rather more modest desktop focused um, releases of this chipset um, that have only, 300 and only <laughs> 384 uh, SPs. So we'll just have to make do if that's what you're using. If you've got a more capable um, laptop or desktop, you may be in, in this range instead. That's all good. As we'll see, the uh, the programming model that's provided by CUDA, and this is really an important idea to keep in mind as you're developing software for these guys, is it's designed to run exactly the same code no matter where you are in the history of these architectures. And in particular, it's designed such that you can actually run this on future architectures. So when the hopper architecture becomes available as actual silicon, we'll be able to take those same programs and run them on the hopper architecture uh, without any modifications at all, because of the abstractions that are provided by the CUDA, uh, the CUDA model for programming.